What if that nagging feeling in the back of your neck was real? What if those hands reaching out from the dark that you believed were there, were there? What if the monster in the basement really existed? And what if there was really something under the bed? Would you have the courage to face your fears? Hello, brave souls. I'm your host, Paul Rondo, and tonight's story is called Twas the Fright Before Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a louse. The traps were all set by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would step there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while nightmares of body parts danced in their heads, and Mama with her hatchet and I in with my axe had just settled down for a little nightcap. When out of the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my chair to see what made the splatter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and ripped through the sash. The moon on the breast of the blood-stained snow gave a hideous glow to objects below. When what to my wondering eye should appear, the watchman was dead with a knife in his ear. There on the lawn knelt a man rather thick. The blood on his coat told me he was Saint Nick. More rapid than vultures, he sprang to his feet. This zombified Santa was hungry for meat. Where are the children? I want them now. Bring them down to me, you ugly fat cow. On time and impatient, I've come to your home. I hunger for brains and I'm not alone. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, a legion of demons flew down from the sky, and up to the housetop this evil took roost, this red beady eyes and long pointy tooth. And then, in a heartbeat, I heard on the roof the digging and pawing of each demon hoof. As I drew my hand and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came down with a growl. He was dressed all the hair of the dead he had skinned, and his clothes were bloodstained from both women and men. With a bundle of cutlery hung on his back, he grabbed for a knife and began his attack. His eyes, they stared through me, his smile freaking scary. His nose was all wrinkled like an old rotten cherry. His droll-like mouth was drawn up like a bow. He slashed at my legs, and I fell to the floor. The stump of my limb he held tight in his teeth, and the blood seeped from it to white tile beneath. He had a cruel face and some blood in his beard. His expression was empty, for my life I now feared. He was ugly and sick, a sick little elf, and I knew things must change for my kids and myself. With my legs now missing, my wife surely dead, I pushed from the floor and kicked Nick in the head. He spoke not a word, but fell straight onto his back, and all the traps sprung just thunderous snap, laying there, writhing, right where he fell. This bastard passed right through the doorway of hell. The demons then vanished. My children were safe. I sat there, crying, beginning to faint. But before I passed out, I screamed with all my might, Scary Christmas to all, and to all a good fright. Perpetual darkness lingered at the top of the world. Thick ice, frigid air, and snow covered the lifeless mountainscape. However, the endless night did not go unchallenged. A single source of light illuminated the sky and drove back the darkness. Nestled between two snow-covered mountains, a little cottage sat with puffy, billowing smoke rising from its chimney. Ignoring the fact that the nearest civilization was thousands of miles away, to the casual eye, the house was simply a warm and welcoming home. Still, one might ask themselves, what an odd thing to find in such a bleak place. How could such a thing come to be? Like most things found in the North Pole, not everything as it appears. The land was unforgiving and cruel. It could take your life within minutes. Only a select number of creatures were given permission to live in this harsh and relentless wilderness. All others who entered this domain did it of their own accord, such as the residents of this tiny little home. However, these individuals were like no other, and with a little bit of magic at their disposal, they lived happy and joyful lives. At first glance, it would appear it was nothing more than a simple, ordinary home inhabited by an elderly couple 
who loved each other dearly. If this were your conclusion, you would be mistaken. In reality, a magical secret existed below, for the small house was much more than meets the eye. The little house was not just a home, but the tip of a mystical workshop hidden beneath the ice. For centuries, children around the world found joy from the efforts of the hidden workshop. All year round, tiny magical hands toiled and labored to create toys and playthings for all the good children of the world. Elves, the last of the magical creatures from old, dwelt within its walls and used their magical nature to create wondrous and joyful things for Christmas morning. Three days after the winter solstice, the old man would put on his heavy coat and boots, take to the air, and deliver his Christmas joy to every last child. Like everything in the cosmos, there must be a balance. For every night, there must be a day. Every beginning has an end. And with every kind child, there was a naughty little boy or girl to be found. Far below the bright lights, singing, and happy elves creating and building new and fantastic toys, there was another workshop. There, the warmth of the hearthstones could not reach. While the purpose of the upper workshop was to bring happiness, the other was dark and sterile. It too had a purpose. It was here where the masses of cheap and easily broken toys were made. There was no love put into these objects. Never would a child's eyes brighten with wonder and awe upon seeing these gifts on Christmas morning. In his wisdom, the old man knew that even a naughty child should not be forgotten during this time of goodwill. However, the old man was no fool and had no desire to waste his resources on such an unsatisfying task. This responsibility was handed to the banished and exiled elves that inhabited the deepest bowels below the workshop, those with selfish hearts and greedy desires. Stripped of their immortality, they wasted away in the dark with only the trinkets and flimsy materials to pass the time. Urga Atta sat in the poorly lit corner of a tattered workbench. His focus was entirely devoted to the old and worn piece of brass in his hands. The clangs of his hammer hitting metal rang out and echoed through the dark halls and passageways. He pounded the brass sheet relentlessly until the metal slowly began to surrender its shape and bend to Urga's design. Suddenly, the hammer flew out of the mad elf's grasp. He examined his limp hand, trying to will it back into his control. Fury filled his heart as he watched the necrotic flesh slew off his bony hand. He didn't have much time. His other hand was weak, but still capable of grasp. He reached into his toolbox and removed a long, warped nail and stabbed it into the back of his paralyzed hand. He pushed on the nail head until its tip broke through the skin and emerged through his palm. Immediately, the pain surged and shot up his arm. The thick and rigid tendons loosened within his hand, giving him temporary use of his digits once more. The elf picked up his hammer and resumed molding the shape of the brass plate. With each impact upon the brass, he poured his rage into his creation. How ironic that the product of his tireless work was meant for the ones he hated the most. His deteriorating body was fading fast. He possessed just enough magic to fuel the curse he would cast upon the object. When finished, his gift would be placed with the other junk toys and cheap trinkets. It would make its way to them and find a child on Christmas morning. The curse will take hold and slowly begin tearing apart their lives. It will channel their essence back to him and reignite his immortality. The object would pass from one child then to another, century after century. He had put just enough magic left to evoke his curse. Urga had once lived and worked above, like any other elf before him. He loved nothing more than to create beautiful and wondrous toys and gizmos. However, in his heart, he wished he could keep some of his creations for himself. One day, his eyes fell upon a beautiful music box his friend D. Halala had created. The music box was extraordinary, meant as a gift for a king's firstborn. It was magnificent, crafted from oak wood. It bore an elaborate gold design on each of its sides. When opened, a figurine of three children danced hand in hand to a beautiful lullaby around a magnificent Christmas tree. Urga Atta had never desired anything more in his entire life. 
it filled his heart with jealousy. He became resentful that his precious and rare treasure would go to an undeserving human infant. The little girl didn't deserve it. It should go to him, he thought. So under cover of darkness, Urga slipped back into the work area and took the music box. Unable to sleep and anxious to put the finishing touches on his prized creation, Delala decided to return to the workshop. To his surprise and shock, he caught the elf attempting to steal a special music box. Delala was enraged, for greed and thievery amongst elves were extraordinarily offensive and not tolerated. Urga begged his friend not to report his transgression, but Delala was unmoved by the pleas and turned to tell the others of Urga's crime. Desperate, Urga did the only thing left for him to do. He grabbed a hammer and brought it down on his friend's head over and over again until no more life remained of the broken body. Despite his meticulous efforts to conceal his crime, he could not escape the sight and wisdom of the old man. Humiliated and dishonored, the elf was banished from the workshop and his precious music box was taken from him and given to the little princess. Stripped of his immortality, Urga Ta was cast into the cold and dark corridors of the other workshop to spend his remaining days, never to create a beautiful thing again. As the seasons passed, his hatred for all children grew and ate away at his insanity. He gritted his teeth, knowing that the children of man were given everything and he had nothing. Hunched over his work, Urga feverishly worked to complete his masterpiece. He stared down at the anvil and hammered down on the brass. Each strike brought the faces of a child into his mind. It lives in warmth. The blunt hammer formed the metal into a hollow cylinder. It stuffs its face with sweets and treats. Stumpy legs were welded into place. It gets everything it asks for from mummy and daddy. A malformed head and crooked ears took shape. It gets anything its little heart desires. The brass surface was scrubbed of debris and grime. It gets everything it wants. Small turquoise stones were affixed to the brass body. I hate it. One glimmering ruby red stone was bound to the left side of the figurine's head. I hate it. Finally, a second red ruby was embedded in the surface of the face's other side. I hate them all. In the glow of the fire, Urga held up the brass figurine. It was a disturbing representation of a rabbit. Its body was of lattice crisscross brass strips, bejeweled with a pale blue turquoise stone at each intersection. Its head was malformed and gave the impression of a dead thing instead of a pleasant rabbit full of life. He placed the atrocious thing upon an open silver locket that contained a mirror on each of the hinged inner sides. With the rabbit figurine facing one of the mirrors, he carefully opened a vial that held a clear fluid. It was lymph. The lymph from an elf was a source of magic that flowed through their bodies, like that of blood for the second set of unique arteries found with its own circulatory system and pumped by a very special second heart. Only a few tiny drops fell out of the vial. It splashed onto the figurine and mirrored locket illuminating them with a golden glow. Urga closed his eyes and spoke the words of Wormwood in his elven tongue. The clear liquid turned black and stained the surface of both the rabbit statuette and silver locket. The glow turned a deep purple and slowly faded. Pleased with the outcome, he gently placed a cloth over the object, without making eye contact to obscure it from sight, and ever so carefully placed it into a small box decorated with holiday cheer. Finished with his work, Urga turned to leave, pushing past the corpses of several elves hanging upside down from the support beams of the other workshop. Their lifeless bodies drained completely of every last drop of magical limp from slit throats. Urga's calculation had been correct. He had just enough magic to fuel the curse placed on the object. The mad elf smiled and began to laugh. <laughs> For the first time in a very long time, Urga Atta's heart filled with anticipation at the approach of Christmas morning. The little girl sat in a large pile of torn wrapping paper from the many gifts she had found under the Christmas tree. On the morning of December 22nd, Gabby awoke earlier than everyone else. She went downstairs and glared at the many presents that continuously tempted her. It was as if they teased and mocked her every time. She looked at the colorful and beautiful wrapping paper. She would receive such a terrible scolding from her parents, but she couldn't wait any longer. At first, 
It'd only be one gift she opened. Then it became two. Then another. And another. Before she knew it, all of her presents had been opened. Despite getting everything she asked for, the desire for more still was not satisfied. When Gabby stood, a small gift next to the base of the Christmas tree caught her eye. She could have sworn it had not been there before. The wrapping paper was worn and yellow with age. Written in big words was a tag that said, To Gabriella. It was like no other, and she surely would have seen it before now. Puzzled, she removed the wrapping paper and found a box that contained a smaller sealed box and a scroll. She opened the scroll and read, Congratulations, lucky one. You are the proud owner of Pepe, the rabbit. Pepe loves you and will be your best friend of the whole world. Pepe is a friend like no other, and he will give you everything your heart desires. To be Pepe's friend, you must listen to him and never disobey the following instructions. 1. Place Pepe on his locket facing the mirror. 2. Never look Pepe in the eyes. He is ever so bashful and only likes to see you through his mirror. 3. You may ask anything of Pepe three times. In three days' time, he will grant any and all asked of him. 4. Never look Pepe in the eyes. It bears repeating. He does not like it and he will be upset if you disobey this rule. Remember, lucky little boy or girl, Pepe loves you. He loves you more than anything else in the whole wide world. Pepe will make sure that no one will ever hurt you again. And if you love Pepe, you will listen to him and do whatever he asks of you. Pepe loves you and no one can ever come between you and him. Pepe loves you. I need to talk like... I really need to talk. The trouble is, I don't have anybody to talk to. My family's estranged, my friends are all gone, and the authorities think I'm a lunatic. It's just five days from Christmas, and I'm alone. Isolated. If I don't get this off my chest, though, I'm afraid it's going to start festering in my mind like a decaying carcass. I'm afraid it's going to sink its teeth in. So I'll talk to you. All of you. It's not perfect, but it will do. My name's Terrence Sims. I'm sitting in my rocking chair, rifle draped across my lap, in blood-stained pajamas that still reek with last night's piss. I haven't slept in two days, and I might not sleep for two more. Last night, something came down my chimney, and I think it's coming back. I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me paint you a picture. I live alone, up in the mountains where the pine trees are draped in snow, and the rivers are in icy blue. I could be a bit more specific, but I don't think it's warranted. Besides that, I like my privacy. All of this to say where I am isn't important. What matters is what I have to say. I'm a researcher, or at least, I was once upon a time. My funding has long been cut, and my job along with it, but I've always stayed out here because I believe in my research my team was undertaking. It was revolutionary. It meant the possibility of bridging worlds, of seeing new life forms. Now I'm terrified that research has found me. You probably heard of monsters, or urban legends, of things that claw at our imaginations and lurk in the dark recesses of our minds. Perhaps you've even felt one. They wait there sometimes, prowling just beyond our vision, tearing at the fabric that holds our realities together, desperate, hungry. My job was to study these beings. I was tasked with developing an understanding of not only what they wanted from us, but how to gain access to their world, the place beyond the veil. Needless to say, I wasn't successful. The organization I worked for, the facility, poured millions into my ideas and wasn't forgiving of my failures. When my theories came up short, they cut ties with me. He cut ties with me. It's unfortunate, but it's business, Mr. Reed had said. Feet on his desk, long hair pulled back in a ponytail. Your failures reflect on me, Terrence, and they become an accounting nightmare. I had begged him, groveled. It didn't matter. I was terminated along with my research. When you're studying the kind of things I am, they don't want that information leaked into the world. It's what they call a liability. So I was blacklisted. Facility teams picked up my reputation, whispering in the back corners of universities and at the water coolers of laboratories. My name became synonymous with paranoia and madness. I was a laughing stock among my peers, a joke. It was the end of my life. Only one person cared to associate with me afterwards a junior colleague, and a brilliant young man named Alexei Azimov. 
He believed in the research nearly as much as I did, and luckily for him, his name wasn't attached to the project. When the facility pulled the plug and dragged my name through the dirt, they simply moved him to a new department. And that was that. Despite it, he spent his vacation days returning to the mountain, assisting me with further study whenever he could. Until last year, when he abandoned me too. But now I've shown them all. I've proven them wrong. Dead wrong. It's here. He's here. I always suspected he lived among these mountains, or at least that his bridge was located within them. But I had given up for hope for so long. It had been years after all. Damn near a decade. They called me absurd. Insane. Then last night, everything changed. I was lying in bed, winding down after logging the readings on the temporal measurement equipment, when the cabin shook. At first, I thought an avalanche had struck it, but then I heard it, a clatter of hooves upon the roof. I shot out of bed, my breath trapped in my chest and my body cold with sweat. I sprinted to the closet and pulled up my hunting rifle. Outside a blizzard howled, but all I heard was a voice, a menagerie of tone and emotion, high and low, guttural and smooth. It rang out from above me. Ho, ho, ho! My first thought was to contact the facility, but my satellite internet was, wasn't functioning in the storm. Even if it were, I knew better. I was too far, too isolated for help. The mountains I study in are remote, and the cabin even more so. It was chosen for seclusion as a means of observing the being known as the Slave Father, but the circumstances were meant to be different. Much different. Above me, the ceiling creaked and dust drifted down from the rafters. Booch crunched upon the snow-caked roof. You always think you'll know what to do when the moment comes, that your training will kick in, and you'll just go through the motions like some kind of pre-programmed robot. I wish that were really true. I really do. I couldn't move. I couldn't think. I'd spent the better part of my career chasing that monster, and now that I found it, I was lost. My fingers played against the trigger of my rifle, my mouth dry, and my eyes latched open. Inside of me, my body thrummed with terror. My fight or flight response oscillated between cowardice and impulsive foolishness. I was paralyzed, alone. A chorus of chattering pierced in the screaming wind. It came fast and jittery, like a ticking clock marking time in microseconds. I knew what it was before the hoofbeats followed. It was them, the creatures the slave father commissioned in the first days when people still feared the night and all the horrors within. Eight abominations stitched together by the innards of mutilated children. Their agony acted as gateway, his bridge between worlds. The souls of the children lived on in the beasts, while their vacant spirits stalked the earth, lost and hopeless, seeking the missing peace that would finally grant them rest. Their tortured existence was his link to our reality, the slay the abominations drew, his bridge. The thought shook me from my trance. I'd spent years waiting for this, a chance to see the other side, to see other worlds, I had to act, so I lurched forward, moving through the lonely cabin while the slave father's footsteps creaked above me. Ho, ho, ho! He lumbered toward the chimney while I shivered down the cold hallway, rifle trembling in my skinny arms. It took me only a few moments to reach the living room, and when I did, I settled there, just behind the corner of the wall. I kept my gun leveled at the fireplace and my eyes plastered open. A crackling blaze danced on the hearth. It cast the sparse furnishings in an orange glow throwing shadows across the love seat and the messy desks. The night became still. The snowstorm quieted. The hoofbeats vanished. There was no sounds of boots, no sound of laughter, only the slapping flames of my heart pounding blood through my skull. My mouth moved, and the words spilled out. Affirmations. Come on, I muttered. Slide down the chimney, you beast. The fire is waiting for you. I knew better. Of course I did. I'd spent years researching the Slave Father consuming tireless hours of reading into his history. Of all the monsters the facility had dealt with, the terrors that haunted old email chains and the urban legends that spread through panic breaths, he was the anomaly. He was celebrated. Santa Claus, they called him. It was an error I traced back to centuries ago when a young girl witnessed her abusive father taken by the slave father. The creature devoured him and left the man's skull as a parting gift, having taken what he came for, a human soul. To the girl, the beast was his savior. A saint. The words she spoke in the following weeks, months, and years became immortalized. They became history, and then they became legend. A jolly being, laughing and hungry, coming down the chimney and leaving gifts in its wake. It was as tantalizing a tale as they come, especially to young children, eager to be appeased to their search for comfort and joy. Now he is here with me, 
looking for another soul to add to his collection. Seconds stretched into minutes as I waited, tucked quietly behind the corner of the wall, rifle in my arms, elbows steadied upon my knee. Once we had contingencies for this, plans in place to provide the means to incapacitate the slave father should he pay us a visit, but those plans involved government agents no longer my employ. They involved expensive technology and complex spells. They were a last resort. A clump of snow fell down the chimney, and a fire responded with a hiss of steam. Its flame retreated for a moment, flickering, before lashing back in anger. Something heavy shuffled above, the sleigh father. Emotions swam inside of me. Regret, anger, fear. Why had I stayed out here? How could I have been so stubborn, so goddamn arrogant? The answer was obvious. My old boss, Donovan Reed, his mockery, his wanton destruction of my life. It left me with no other option. Either I remain on this mountain, burning through my life savings and hunting wayward game, or I returned home. One meant a chance of redemption, the other guaranteed humiliation and disgrace. I hated Mr. Reed more than words could say. Alexei had seen it. He'd seen how much my loathing distracted me, and so he recommended methods to help get the snake off my mind. A list, he'd said in the email last month. Write a list of all the ways you want to hurt him. Write a list of all the horrible things you want to happen to him. I think it could help you get it off your head and free up your attention. It helped. A little. Ho ho ho! The laugh came high and low, husky and slick. A crunch followed it, like something digging into brick, and panic found its way into my house. Dust and debris fell into the flames. The slave father's legend was explicit in the form of entry. If possible, it was always the chimney. A grunt came down the flue, followed by more pebbles and stones. Then, the cabin shook. It was as if something heavy had just jumped down from the roof. What comes up must come down. A pulverizing cacophony filled the night with cannon fire. Rubble tumbled in the blazing hearth while the bricks of the chimney bulged outwards, crumbling as something massive shot down it. I barely brought my rifle on aim before our figure crashed into the flames. Burning logs thundered with a thunderous crack, plunging the cabin into inky darkness. Wooden splinters ricocheted around the room like a blazing shrapnel, their slivers slashing my face and tracing my skin in searing agony. I spun back behind the protection of my hallway wall, rifle clutched to my chest. My thoughts raced. This couldn't be happening, I said to myself. It couldn't. I slammed my eyes shut, trying to get my out-of-control breathing back in line. I was hyperventilating, panicking. I had to calm down because if I didn't, I would start making impulsive decisions, and impulsive decisions were a good way to die. I opened my eyes. The fire was gone. I could barely see a thing. A short distance away, boots groaned against hard wood, kicking past broken legs in the hearth. My fingers quivered against the cold steel of the rifle's trigger, and I desperately wanted to pull it. But I knew if I did that, then it was over. Either the slave father would die, or I would. The odds, I decided, were not in my favor. So I waited. A piece of me, infinitesimally small, wanted to see him. Wanted to flick on a light of blinding fire into the darkness. I wanted to witness the monster that possessed my life for so long. And only for a second. But I didn't. It's not worth it, I told myself. It's not worth it. The footsteps stalked to the window, dragging something heavy behind it. Against the faint light of the moon, I made up the slave father's silhouette. He was tall, inhumanly so. His neck craned forward pressed against the top of the high cabin ceiling. A cloak was draped across his broad shoulders, and from his head slumped the palm of a stocking cap. Besides him, a large sack. Naughty or nice? His voice hummed in discordant melody. I didn't reply. It seemed impossible, but a part of me held on to the belief that maybe he wasn't speaking to me. Maybe he didn't know I was there. It was just a monologue, perhaps. Words for the night. I raised the rifle, aiming it towards his massive figure. I could do it now, I reasoned. I could pull the trigger and hopefully make this nightmare disappear. Ho ho ho! The silhouette turned, its face masked in shadows, save for a single glint of bobbing light. Careful with that, it said. A cold breeze swept across me, and suddenly my fingers burned with agonizing frostbite. My rifle clattered to the floor while my hands trembled in pain. You'll take your eye out. What do you want? I stuttered, stumbling backward. My feet croaked on the floorboards as I came up against the back of the hallway. My heart hammered. Tears filled my visions as I cradled my cold hands against my stomach. Please, I whimpered. Naughty? He sang. Or nice. 
Nice, I said. I'm a good man. I just wanted to learn about you. The words stumbled out of my mouth like lemmings falling to their death. I didn't mean any harm, I swear. The footsteps creaked closer, and as they did, the silhouette vanished in the window's moonlight. All that remained of it now was sound it made. I listened intently to the burdensome echoes of boots on hardwood and the heavy scratching of coarse fabric being dragged across the floor. Ho ho ho! He was close, so close. I slammed my eyes shut, waiting for the inevitable, waiting to die. Warm piss spilled down my leg, and my face screwed up as I fell to my knees, bawling on the floor. Please, I begged. I'm a good man, I told you, please! The rumble of footfalls stopped, and in their place came the sound of ruffling fabric, like somebody opening a sack. Nice, you say? A dim light formed, raiding it out of a burlap bag some five feet away. Behind its glow, I could make out a white, singed beard hanging off a red suit. The slave father's face was otherwise indiscernible amidst the suffocating shadow, save for one dancing speck of light. Would you like a gift, he said. My mind raced. Was there anything in the mythology that warned against accepting gifts? I couldn't recall. Yes, I hazarded in a small voice. Yes, please. It seemed unwise to refuse the creature. Ho, ho, ho! A massive red jacketed arm reached into the burlap sack. My eyes widened in horror as I realized the sack was moving, kicking, like there was something alive inside of it. Muffled screams followed, and the great arm pulled back, clutching a man by his long blonde hair. The man thrashed and whimpered. Tears soaked his pale face. Our eyes connected, mine and the man's, and something ran through me. It was a feeling I had never experienced before. A mixture of dark excitement and absolute loathing. You, I said slowly. The light from the sack was dim, but to the man, it was all he had known. It took a moment for his eyes to adjust to the heavy darkness of the cabin, and as they did, he peered toward me. Eyelids pinched together to discern the voice speaking to him. Who's there, he whimpered. I gazed forward in stunned silence. Was this real? There was no way. He dangled in the sleigh father's grasp like the finest Christmas present I've ever seen. Hello? His voice called. Please, I have resources. More than you can imagine. I'm a powerful man in government. Just get me the hell out of here, and I'll give you whatever you want. His voice turned weak, broken. P please, please get me out of here. I have a family. I opened my mouth, but if words were there, I didn't speak to them. No, it seemed wasteful. At this moment, to reply so thoughtlessly, this moment necessitated careful words and measured tone. It required my best. Naughty? The slave father hummed. So, so naughty. I found myself nodding along. Yes, the man was naughty. The worst. He was an abomination, fit for disposal. He doubted me, made a mockery of me, and torn apart my life so carefully built. Donovan, I said, doing my best to keep my voice level. Donovan Reed, isn't it? The light was faint, so faint, in spite of it though, I could hear Mr. Reed had finally realized who I was, whether because his eyes had adjusted or recognized my voice, perhaps a combination of the two. His expression fell. That voice, you used to work for me, he choked out, didn't you? I gazed at him, something horrible growing inside of me. It ate up all my fear, my regret, my rage, and you're left only hunger in the wake, a desperate desire for retribution. I did. Part 2 A pause. He sensed it there, in my reply. He sensed the disdain, the hatred. I'm so sorry, he said at length. You were right. You were right about everything. That's true, I said. And you were wrong. Yes, I was. He winced in agony as the slave father lifted him higher by his tangled hair, then gently nudged him with a giant, clawed hand. Mr. Reed swung like a pendulum. You were right, he continued weeping. He's real. A fucking course he is. Are you- Am I what? I interjected, my hands still burning with frostbite. It became an afterthought in my mind. The warm piss in my pants hardly registered to me. I was beginning to build the puzzle. I was beginning to understand what this was. Are you asking me if I'm going to help you? Silence. Of course I'll help you, I said. I'm not a monster. Why would I ruin your life? All because you made a simple mistake? In the quiet of the cabin, Mr. Reed's shuddering tears struck the floorboards like gunshots. Thank you so much, 
He hardly sounded like the man I knew. If he wasn't swinging in front of me, with this obnoxious long hair and his fitted suit, I'd almost have doubted my own ears. He sounded weak, cowardly. I'll ask the slave father to lease you, if you can do one thing for me. Ho ho ho! What is it? Anything. Your research is back on the table. Of course it is. You're brilliant. Look at you. You saw this before any of us. You knew it was out there and... What's my name? I'm sorry? His words, once thundering along like a roller coaster, crumbled in a heap. Look, I'm not in a position to remember every fucking employee's name. That was years ago. You need to be reasonable. I took a step forward, and the floorboards creaked. I understood what the situation was now. It was written in the subtext of the legend. The unspoken and unwritten words that undercut everything about the slave father. A singular concept. One still celebrated this day. Holiday cheer. I reached out a hand, gripping Mr. Reed by his silky black tie. His swinging stopped, and I pulled at the accessory, making him choke and gag. Are you fucking crazy? His face had lost the fear, the concern, the false remorse, and its place was something much more familiar. Malice. I let him go, and he gasped as his breath returned to him. My eyes shifted to the being behind him, the instrument of destruction. The slave father remained still, clouded by darkness, with only his massive arm and singed white beard illuminating the dim light spilling from his bag. Naughty or nice, the monster repeated, in that discordant voice masquerading his song. Naughty or nice, the monster repeated, in that discordant voice masquerading his song. My eyes connected with Mr. Reed's, and an irresistible smile crept across my lips. To see him there, helplessly hanging by his hair and enslaved to my whims, filled something inside of me I didn't realize I was missing. It filled a need for power, a need to be respected. Naughty, I said, surprising myself with a tone of authority. Donovan Reed is a terrible man. Ho ho ho! No! Mr. Reed screamed. Even as the great red arm lifted him up to the rafters of the ceiling, his face screwed up in agony as the slave father gripped his legs with one other hand. Please! He shrieked, horizontal in the air. Please! I'm sorry! I'm so- His words were interrupted by the wet splatter of his intestines striking the cabin floor. It was hard to see in the darkness, but easy to hear. I listened as the slave father pulled Donovan and Reed apart, one end from the other, his innards slapping against the ground like spoiled fruit. Why? Mr. Reed's last words died on his lips as the slave father slammed both pieces of him against the cabin floor drenching me in the explosion of blood and bone. When it was finished, I sat in warm, wet silence. Donovan Reed's blood dripped from my mess of hair and soaked through my thermal pajamas. Something akin to a near-death experience flashed before my eyes, except it was aspects of my life and my research. I always believed the slave father had been little more than a simple reaper, a monster hunger for souls or other forms of mortal sustenance piercing the veil once a year when its hunger grew too insatiable to ignore. I had been wrong. Much of the Santa Claus mythology fitted the Slave Father. More than I or Alexi ever expected. He didn't just feed on souls, he fed on people's joy, their mirth. It appears as though he required both pieces to be fully satiated, and such a phenomenon provided much more context to the original myth. That girl centuries ago had been joyous when the slave father devoured her father, hadn't she? And now I had been joyous when he gifted me with my revenge. I'd felt ecstatic watching Mr. Reed die. Ho ho ho! The cabin began to tremble, and soon the very floorboards snapped and the windows rattled. It felt like I was being torn from its foundation. I steadied myself against the wall as a blinding light exploded from Donovan Reed's skull before quelling to a gentle gleam. It snaked around the cabin revealing the full extent of the building's disarray. Tables had been upturned, documents littered the floor, and the fireplace had been little more than a pile of bricks and a frigid breeze. Shafts of moonlight pierced through the hole in the ceiling, the chimney once occupied, revealing Mr. Reed's blood and bones scattered all over. The cabin was soaked in his blood. Then the floating light passed across the sleigh father. It revealed a behemoth, clad in crimson cotton with white trim. Two legs burst from the long red jacket coated in coarse black fur that ended in leather boots. As the light swam upwards, I caught sight of the creature's arms scratching at its barrel chest. Its fingers were thick, human, but decaying. 
what I had early mistaken for claws were actually long, curled fingernails. Thank you, I breathed, my heart thuttering. Thank you for this. Tis the season, it sang with a laugh. The orb of light ascended toward its mouth, and for the first time, I saw the monster's face. It was human but mangled. Above its white shock of beard were two pieces of coal seared into its eye sockets. The skin of its face was discolored, a pockmarked mess of swollen, blistered flesh that sagged around its skull. And its nose was little more than two slits, with the faintest impression of bone jutting from beneath. Burns, I realized. His face had been burned beyond recognition. As the tiny orb of light finished its accent, it revealed the slave father's red stock and cap. At the end of the white palm, and it blinked. It was looking at me. An eyeball twinkled where the palm should have been, glimmering like a star in the night. It seemed clear to me the creature meant to me no harm, and so the researcher inside of me took over. Can I ask you, I began, before being cut off by a roaring sound of wind. The slave father had opened its mouth, and when it's within its jaws, a blizzard roared, frigid and horrible. My hands, anguished with frostbite, became numb and unresponsive. My ears screamed and my nose throbbed. My entire body ached with the stabbing sensation of absolute winter. Then the light orb vanished, sucked up inside the slave father's mouth, and so did the cold. I heard that sound like a gulp and a swallow, and then another discordant, tuneless round of HO HO HO! Darkness returned. The slave father turned. His twinkling eye vanished as he did, and before walking away from me, his lumbering footfalls crunched along the cabin floor snapping pieces of Mr. Reed's bones as he made his way to the demolished chimney. Merry Christmas to all, the slave father sang. I heaved a breath. Warmth returned to my extremities. I couldn't help but smile. For the first time in decades, I felt full of Christmas cheer. So much so, I even finished the rhyme form. And to all a good night. His boots stopped, and the floor groaned as he turned back to me. The bouncing eyes gleamed in the night. Merry Christmas to all. He repeated, though his voice had lost its whimsy. I'll see you in two nights. My jaw fell open, the smile dying on my lips. No, that wasn't right. Why would he come back? I already had what I wanted. Mr. Reed was dead. The slave father turned around toward the chimney, chuckling to himself. Hang on, I spat, my voice crackling. You don't have to come back, it's fine. Seeing you was enough. I just needed to know I wasn't crazy. That was right. Naughty, he hummed. All right. I blinked, not understanding the, that wasn't the rhyme. Nice, I said. Not naughty. I'm nice. A good person, abused and taken advantage of. Just like the girl you saved, remember? Ho, ho, ho. His laughter echoed around the ruined cabin. Naughty and right. I'll see you in two nights. He stepped in the remains of the ruined chimney, and the shaft of moonlight framed through the broken ceiling. His beard returned with a smile, and then he bent his great legs and leapt upward with a grunt. A moment later, the ceiling trembled, and pieces of rafter crashed down around me. Above, I heard the slave father's chorus of HO HO HO, and his heavy boots crunched on snow. Then came the whips of rain and rapid chatter of eight abominations preparing to take flight. Their hooves pounded against the roof in anticipation. Two more whip cracks and the cabin rafters whined as the sleigh began to move, slowly at first before the monsters broke into a rumbling gallop. Through the shattered ceiling, I caught sight of the godless creature taking flight. There were monsters in the truest sense of the word. Pieces of children chopped up and reassembled in a beast of burden. Some had six legs and one arm. Others had three heads and four feet upon two legs. At the last remnants of the slave father's laughter faded in the distance. I idly wondered if he was purposely designed the beast to be more hideous than himself. I chewed on the thought as I stumbled toward the kitchen, grabbing a flashlight from the drawer and flicking it on as I went. I used it to locate a blanket and a laptop, and then took a seat in the old rocking chair. With the blizzard gone, the night was uncharacteristically warm. Whether or not that was a consequence of the slave father's visit, I couldn't say. But I was thankful for it, and made thinking easier. I flipped the computer open, and my face bathed in blue glow. I noted the satellite connection was back online. Good. My fingers rocketed across the keyboard sending out multiple emails to my contacts at the facility. I've done it, I told them. I've proven the existence of the slave father. Not only that, I added, but he told me he's returning in two days' time. We can acquire his sleigh, his bridge. 
I hit send, exhaling a sigh of relief. I truly had done it. I had redeemed my name. I had resurrected my reputation and executed the monster that murdered it in the first place. It had been a busy night, an important night. I fully believed the slave father would have returned for me, but with the facility's resources, I suspected we could handle him. Their warlocks could do wonderful things with spells. My computer pinged with my first email alert. A reply from the facility's hiring manager. I figured, why wait? I had a job to return to. The sooner I got paid for my work again, the better. Good evening, Dr. Sims, it read. Your work for this facility has been greatly appreciated. Unfortunately, we have located another talent that has proven more reliable. Your contract will not be reinstated. I stared at the screen in confusion. What? Had they even read my email? I just told them I located the damn slave father. I just explained how I found the bridge between worlds. Cursing, I began typing my response. Two more email alerts pinged in the corner of my screen, distracting me. No matter, I thought to myself. The hiring manager could wait. I clicked on the first new email. It was from an old colleague of mine, Anna Ling, a foreign team member of the Slave Father Research Project, and one with high-level security access. I am so sorry, it read. Take care, Terry. Sorry? Did you think I was insane? I clenched my fist, my frustration mounting as the thick-headedness of these idiots. I was sitting on possibly the most significant discovery in the history of mankind, and they were brushing me off like a common madman. Bitterly, I clicked on the third email. It was from the Director of Research and Development, Mr. Reed's boss. Good to hear from you, Terrence. First off, I'd like to say we're recommending you for the Medal of Merit. Your work has been incredible, and dare I say, worthy of certain additional awards down the line. Can you say Nobel Prize? I paused, a smile formed my lips. This is more like it. I always found the director of R&D to be a shrewd and clever woman. It was little wonder she saw the potential of an opportunity as soon as I presented it. I continued reading. Of course, public awards are off the table until the bridge has been put to proper use. We'll have to deal with upcoming conflicts first before spilling the beans with this new technology. But trust me, once we can, your name is going to be in the hat. I'll be personally recommending you. I imagine you'll probably be a little upset. It's a terrifying prospect. What's to come, but... I blinked, shaking my head in confusion. Terrifying? That's an odd way to describe a Nobel Prize. No matter, I continued reading. Unfortunately, it was the only option we saw available. Dr. Asimov has been a huge help in getting all this set up, and we're genuinely thankful for the cooperation in the matter. What's losing another 30 years of life when you're immortalized in history, eh? Dr. Asimov? Alexei Asimov? What the hell? That couldn't be right. Alexei abandoned the project a year ago. Sure, he occasionally kept up with me via email, more for my sanity than anything, but he had nothing to do with this. His mental exercise of list listing my intrusive thoughts helped clear my head some, but that didn't warrant accolades. I did this. Me. Furious, I clicked reply. Before I could finish the first word of my response, my computer pinged with another email. It was the last contact I'd messaged. Alexi. Terrence. I hope you're well. In fact, I suspect you're feeling quite good, if not a little confused. I know how much the Slave Father project meant to you. To be frank, your obsession with it concerned me. It isn't healthy. It's damaging. Before I go any further, I'd like to assure you that the facility will be arriving at the mountain later this evening. They'll be monitoring you from a safe distance, and when the Slave Father returns in two nights' time, they'll attempt to apprehend the bridge. I let loose a sigh of relief. Good. I knew I can count on Alexei, even if he was trying to steal some credit for this. I cracked a smile and kept reading. It was probably a misunderstanding. Earlier this year, I discovered some lore. I thought I might help both of us. You and I, you see, old friend, I have come to realize that Slave Father shares more in common with the Santa Claus myth than either of us recognized. All these weeks, months, and years of studying failed, and failed attempts to locate the monster were rooted in singular problems. We were too focused on science. The Slave Father is a being that transcends science. Of course, an anomaly, a myth. So it was that mythology I returned. Within it, I found the means to quell some of your suffering and offer you an opportunity to have a Merry Christmas before you pass from this world. My fingers ached. I realized I was clutching the sides of my laptop hard enough that the plastic shell was beginning to crack. I reread Alexi's words. Before I pass from this world? What kind of phrasing is that? Trust me, Terrence. It would be better for you this way. Easier. I know you're probably wondering what I'm talking about, so let me provide you with some background details. 
I discovered that lists have the power to summon the Slave Father. They act as a sort of ritual or an offering to it. When one creates a list, the creature will sometimes dine them with their request, providing they want it desperately enough. It is an emotional energy that calls to the Slave Father. It feeds upon our joy and our sorrow, our wishes and fears. Your list to Donovan Reed was drenched in emotion. I suspected that if my theory was correct, given your relative proximity to the Slave Father's bridge and your hatred for Mr. Reed, you could provoke an encounter with that being. I'm happy to hear I was correct in this regard. My eyes scanned his words, my teeth dug into my lip. That son of a bitch. That absolute piece of shit. I made to get up and grab a new piece of paper, one I could use to write Alexi's name on it. I'd listed a thousand times, with a thousand different ways I wanted them dead. But the email wasn't finished. Of course there's more to the Santa Claus mythology than simple lists. There are consequences. One such consequence is when somebody requests something selfish or sufficiently deplorable. It is the naughty or nice paradigm, and we see it reflected heavily in the mythology. It's what I was counting on tonight. You desire for Mr. Reed's death was selfish and frankly monstrous. You'll excuse my dry sense of humor, but it really was a naughty sort of thing. I'm genuinely sad to know Mr. Reed passed with such brutality, but I'm happy to know it will pave the way to ending the coming war and saving billions of lives. When the Slave Father returns to claim your deplorable soul, please know it was never something I wanted. If you could have lived, I would have preferred that. Same to Mr. Reed. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, and sacrifices must be made. The eldritch horrors are knocking on the front door. Terrence, you know that. You know I have no choice. Just know that you and Mr. Reed will be remembered for what you gave. Carpe diem, old friend. P.S. If it is possible, please draw the Slave Father as far from his bridge as you can. Our team will have an easier time retrieving the sleigh that way. Happy holidays, Alexi. I closed the laptop. I didn't even bother writing a reply. What was there left to say? Fuck you, asshole? No, it wasn't worth the energy. I doubted that he'd even care to read it. He already got everything he wanted, after all. He had me right where he wanted me, and now we could get all the credit. That son of a bitch. I stewed in my rage for a long time. Long enough for the birds chirping overhead and the golden light of dawn seeping in through the cabin window. Eventually, I decided what would happen next. You would. All of you. See, the Slave Father might be coming for me tonight, and it might be true that I don't have a way out of here. The facility is too powerful, too all-reaching, but not even they can stop the wildfire of public outrage. So here it is, my testament, the true account of the final days of my life, and the research that led to it. I'm not asking to be deified. I'm not even asking for a street in my name. I just want people to know the real story about what happened out here, on this snowy mountain. You'll forgive me for not trusting the facility to represent my contributions to this project properly. They've already spoiled my name once. Who's to say they won't be dragging it through the dirt after I'm dead? Words are cheap, and I know better than to trust my emails from suits. So I'm begging you to spread this far and wide. Tell my story the way it truly happened, warts and all. I'm not a perfect person, but I'm not a madman either. The Slave Father came to me. I witnessed him. Not Alexi. Me. Tonight when their creature returns, I won't even run from my death. I'll leave the bastard away, just like that snake Alexi asked. I'll be my final contribution to my life's research. A contribution I hope might lead to a better world someday. If they manage to steal a sleigh, then it'll be a colossal boon in the war to come. If they don't, well, just be careful what you wish for Christmas. Some gifts aren't worth the price. Ho ho ho! For most children, Christmas is a celebration worth looking forward to. For 13-year-old Evan, it was something to fear. Evan still remembered his seventh Christmas Eve clearly. An evening that he, like most children, had been looking forward to for a long time. The next morning, he would get up early and open up all his presents, eager to see what surprises Santa had left for him. Evan imagined the restless night ahead and thought, if he listened hard, he might be able to hear Santa come down the chimney. But this Christmas Eve didn't all go to plan. It wasn't long before Evan's excitement gave way to horror. Mum had insisted that Santa wouldn't come if Evan stayed up late, and she had began sending him off to bed when Evan was distracted by a loud, 
muffled thump on the roof. It seemed to be coming directly above the fireplace. It was like in the night before Christmas. There arose such a clatter, and Evan approached the chimney to see what was the matter. Was it now that Santa decided to make an appearance? Ash was falling from the nooks and crannies of the chimney to the bottom of the fireplace, sending out charcoal smoke and a burnt smell. Something, someone, had to be disturbing the ash. Evan was alone. Who else went down the chimney at this time on Christmas Eve? The chimney rattled, and a deep, rolling voice hit the air. Santa's famous, Ho, ho, ho! echoed down the chimney as Evan watched in delight. Things were silent for a moment. Evan's mother stood behind him, watching. Then arose the biggest clatter yet. There was an explosion of grayish smoke as mountains of ash fell to the bottom of the fireplace. The fireplace shook as if there was a sudden earthquake. Then, amidst the grayness, there was a flash of red and a tremendous thump. Had Santa made it? Evan rushed forward, unable to stop himself. He felt a flare of excitement, but Mum was the first to the chimney. Evan tried to remember the last time his mother had expressed excitement, and couldn't. Then the smoke cleared, and the fallen Santa came into view. He didn't have quite the belly Evan was expecting, but this was the least of his observations. Evan gasped as he saw that Santa's beard had appeared to slide off during his fall. But there was no blood. The only blood came from Santa's head, and it was just a trickle. The bad thing was that the trickle of blood was coming from what looked like a big dent in Santa's head. Evan frowned. Santa couldn't die. He was too good for that. He couldn't die. Not now. So had somebody played a trick on him? Evan glanced at the beard that had appeared to slide down Santa's face. Beards didn't move like that, at least not without there being blood. So then it wasn't a real beard. It had to be a fake one. But if that was a fake beard, then Santa's suit was also a fake suit. This wasn't the real Santa. This was a Santa in disguise. Evan glanced once more at the fake Santa's exposed features, trying to figure out who this person could be. It made sense of the face that seemed so familiar to him. He realized, for the first time, that Mum had never been excited. Instead, she had rushed to the fake Santa's body in grief. Sobs racked her body, her tears dripping on the fake Santa suit. Evan stood dumbfounded and choked out one word. Dad? Evan woke up in a cold sweat, bolting upright into a sitting position. He glanced at his watch and read the time, 2.19 a.m. Before the light of his watch went off, he read the date, December 20th, only five more days until Christmas. Once upon a time, Evan would have been happy about this, but now he wished that Christmas never came. It was the same dream again, accurate in every detail. That evening was exactly how it had been in the dream. It never ceased to amaze Evan how vivid those dreams were. They got right down to the core and forced Evan to relive the worst moment in his life. These goddamn nightmares! They got worse around Christmas. He would dream of that fateful evening his father slipped and fell down the chimney, smashing his skull on the way down. Or he would dream of those claws, those razor-sharp strips of polished bone. Weapons that could slice through him like butter if they gave so much of a flick. Most kids grew out of their belief in Santa. Came to accept that Santa was just another myth made up to make children happy. But Evan hadn't grown out of it. He had just jolted out of it. His belief shattered with the tragic death of his father. Evan's father had only been trying to surprise Evan. But he had done much more than that. He had bent Evan beyond repair. And every Christmas... Santa Claus would haunt Evan. Evan was convinced Santa Claus was some kind of demon in humanoid form. He was definitely not human. He was a supernatural entity of sorts. But Evan had always thought of him as a demon. Santa Claus had been in Evan's life ever since his father died. And though he was mostly absent during the year, he would come back around November, maybe late October, when it became nearer to Christmas. Well, he would become more persistent then. There were the nightmares, for one thing, and the visions. 
and Evan had no shortage of seizures around Christmas time. When Santa Claus was at his worst, sometimes Evan had panic attacks that seemed to come from nowhere, and there was no doubt who had caused them. Evan was no stranger to bullying at school because of his seizures and his strong dislike for Christmas. Santa Claus had taken its toll on Evan. Evan knew that Santa Claus had it, in some way, been triggered by his father's death. Sometimes Evan believed that Santa Claus was actually his father's ghost, turned evil in the existence of the afterlife. Evan wasn't one to believe in supernatural, but Santa Claus had changed his mind about a lot of things. After a while, Evan had been forced to accept that Santa Claus was always going to be come back. Even if Evan grew out of his own personal dislike for Christmas, he would never have a joyful Christmas again. It was Christmas that had caused his father's death. It was Christmas that had caused Santa Claus to come. Evan's head flopped back on his pillow. School had finished weeks before, but Evan was still dreading the next day, and every day to come until Christmas. What Evan was looking forward to was the absence of Santa Claus. Santa Claus would hang around for a bit after Christmas, then he'd slowly fade away, and Evan would be free of his presence between February and November. Then, he could forget about Christmas, pretend it never existed. But no matter what, Santa Claus would always come back, and Evan was sure he would never be free of his demonic existence. Evan woke up early and rolled out of bed, opened his laptop without bothering to draw the curtains or turn on the light. He wanted to go online, check his Facebook, play some games, do anything to take his mind off of Christmas and, more importantly, Santa Claus. It was an hour or two before Evan sat down to a lazy breakfast of cornflakes, by which time Evan's mother had gotten out of bed. Mum had shut herself out from society a while after she unexpectedly became a widow, developing a strong case of depression. Eventually, she had come to terms with her husband's death, and became a more loving mother to Evan than ever. But she still had her bad days. Sometimes Evan wondered whether Santa Claus was in her mind, too. They both supported each other a lot but Evan couldn't help but feel that the house was lonely every once in a while. Evan had told his mom about Santa Claus for the first few years after his father's death, but then he had decided to pretend he had outgrown it. He didn't want to put extra weight on mom's shoulders, and the last thing he wanted to do was make it seem like he was a child. But Evan couldn't hide the seizures. He couldn't hide the fact that he was sometimes absorbed in a hallucination, often concerning Santa Claus. Evan's mom seemed to blame it on the trauma he had received after his father's death. Sure, maybe not all kids would experience that type of trauma, but everyone's different, aren't they? Evan said good morning to mom and continued to eat his cornflakes. The fireplace was directly to his right, and Evan thought he could catch a glimpse of red out of the corner of his eye. His head turned nothing. Paranoia. Or maybe Santa Claus was playing tricks on him. Either way, Evan didn't fancy seeing Santa Claus in the flesh. He had seen him already, five times to be exact. It would see him a sixth time, for every Christmas Eve at 8.13 p.m., the exact time his father had fallen. He appeared in the fireplace, and Evan was always there to watch him make an appearance. It was then that Evan decided that this year, he was going to be prepared. It would be no different to any other year. Santa Claus would appear in the fireplace at exactly the time he had the year before, and the year before that, and the year before that. Mum was never around. She always went to bed early on Christmas Eve, or stayed in bed the entire day. This time, Evan wouldn't just be watching Santa Claus. He'd destroy Santa Claus once and for all. Why hadn't he thought of it before? That day, Evan confined himself to the safety of his home, or, more specifically, his bedroom. He distracted himself with computer games and other activities, while all the time planning how he was going to get rid of Santa Claus when he made an appearance. Before his father died, he had a hunting rifle that hung on a hook in the wall. After his death, it had been hidden away inside his wardrobe, which was, of course, in the bedroom Mum slept in. A gun was Evan's closest shot and it was the only thing he could think of that might kill Santa Claus. What else was he supposed to do? Shout a few defiant words and attack Santa Claus with his bare hands? His father's... 
His dead father's old hunting rifle was the only gun possible for Evan to obtain. The only problem was getting it out of the wardrobe without his mother catching him. And she was sure to get suspicious if she saw him taking a gun out of the wardrobe. This proved to be an easier task than Evan thought, however. When Mom went out to do some shopping, Evan went straight to the wardrobe doors and started burrowing through the clothes. It was then that he experienced the seizure. Evan had just caught sight of the gun when a sudden jolt ran through his body. His muscles were paralyzed, his joints frozen in place. Evan was unable to do anything but stare helplessly as he fell backwards onto the wooden floor. Electricity ran through his body, which was now twitching madly on the floor. Shadows danced in front of his eyes as the visions began. He saw his father, now an ash-covered skeleton wearing a Santa hat, leering down at him through empty eye sockets. He saw a Christmas tree decorated with bloodied limbs, organs, and what looked like unraveled intestines. He saw claws curling in front of his eyes, claws that could cut him in two if he did so much as blink. Evan came to just as he heard the car pulling in the driveway. Frantically, his eyes darted around, searching for the hunting rifle. Something thin and black poking out from a pile of clothes caught his eye. The rifle! He snatched it up and bolted toward his room, not remembering to close the wardrobe door. He had just reached his bedroom when Mum opened the front door. It wasn't until his mother called out to him an hour or so later, Evan, have you been through my wardrobe? That Evan remembered he had neglected to close the wardrobe door. Uh, yeah, Evan replied, thinking quickly. I was looking for a jacket. You know, since all my other ones are too small. It's pretty cold, with the snow and all. Evan was proud that his voice didn't so much as quiver because of this. Mom didn't pursue the subject any longer. And that one day, Evan experienced the seizure inside the wardrobe. Frequent flashes of moment out of the corner of his eye, and a brief hallucination. Usually it was worse around this time, but Evan had it lucky. The nightmares didn't improve that night. The next day, Evan realized he had no bullets for the rifle. He had forgotten to find some in his panic to get out of the room before his mom saw. Mom didn't go out that day, but Evan decided to have a look through the wardrobe anyway, and if she asked, he'd make up the same lies yesterday. After some serious rummaging, he found three stray bullets hidden in a corner of the wardrobe in a plastic casing. This time, he didn't forget to close the wardrobe door. He put the bullets in his pocket in case Mom should enter the hallway. But she didn't. The plan was looking successful. That day, Santa Claus talked to Evan. The words were spoken inside Evan's head, but Evan knew well who they belonged to. Evan found he couldn't remember most of the speech afterwards, but knew it had something to do with Evan's plan to kill Santa Claus. Of course, Santa Claus could get inside Evan's head, so why shouldn't he be able to read Evan's thoughts? This is what he had done. Still, Evan wasn't prepared to give up so quickly. That day, he might have seen a lot of things weren't there, but Evan kept his thoughts on that loaded rifle. On the 22nd of December, Evan not only heard Santa Claus and experienced his visions, but also felt Santa Claus in his own flesh. At one point, it felt like a cat was running its claws across his arm, but no one was there. Still, that didn't stop blood from flowing. When Mom asked what had happened to his arm, he said that Stormo had scratched him. Evan had an old tabby cat called Stormo, and was no stranger to his scratches. Mum didn't notice the seizures and hallucinations, simply because Evan confined himself to his room all day. It was a pitiful existence, but Evan knew he had to do it to avoid suspicion. Mum blamed it on what had happened with his father, relating it to past trauma, and as a consequence, feeling the need to shut himself away from what the experience had been related to. Christmas. Evan didn't have any problems with this. The 23rd passed quickly, the 24th was the worst day he had experienced so far. He spent much of his time being tormented by the demonic presence of Santa Claus, his frightening messages ringing in his ears. Once, Mum walked in the room while he was having a seizure on his bed, but was able to avoid suspicion by saying he was in the middle of a nightmare. Time dragged on. As Evan became more and more tormented, Evan's mother went to bed early, as she normally did on Christmas Eve. This left Evan two more hours until Santa Claus made an appearance. Every past year, Evan had been at the fireplace at 
but this was because Santa Claus had willed him to be there. He had felt his legs move and had been unable to stop them. Santa Claus wanted Evan to be there to see him in the flesh. This was why Evan made sure he had the rifle clutched tightly in his hands before the time came. Evan glanced at his watch nervously. No. He was past nervous. He was terrified. 8.13 came, and nothing happened. But at the 22nd mark, he felt his legs moving down the hallway towards the lounge. His hands opened the lounge door. He approached the fireplace. The curtains were drawn. The lights were out. It was dark, and Evan could see nothing save the silhouette of Santa Claus in the fireplace. Evan could see the outline of a Santa hat on his head. It was no stranger to the claws that hung at the shadow's side. Evan felt the presence of Santa Claus. He knew that Santa Claus would soon be illuminated by a ghostly light, and Evan would be able to see him in the flesh. Then he would raise the gun, pull the trigger, and it would be over. Or so he hoped. Evan stood there for what seemed like forever. Then the empty, bleeding eye sockets came into view. That white, almost transparent skin. The sharp, bloody set of teeth that showed from behind slimy lips. The tattered Santa suit smeared the blood of innocent victims, and worst of all, the long, knife-sharp set of claws that hung at each side. Evan was terrified. He stood paralyzed with fear as Santa Claus grinned and raised his hands toward him. Evan was unable to move, unable to do anything, but watched as the claws came closer and closer to reaching him. It was too late to shoot now. It was all over. But as Evan stood frozen, his muscles stiffened and his fingers tightened around the trigger. There was a terrific bang and a blinding flash of light. Then world faded to black. Evan woke to mum, shaking him frantically. He blinked, trying to figure out what had happened. Then he remembered. He had killed Santa Claus. Mum said she had heard a bang and had come in to see what the noise was. When she saw that Evan was holding the hunting rifle, her first thought was that Evan had shot himself. But she had seen there was no noticeable bullet wound, and Evan was clearly still breathing. Evan was exhausted, but too happy to comment. His face broke into a smile. I did it, he whispered. Mum looked concerned. You're not well, Evan. You're going to a doctor as soon as possible. I worry about you. I killed Santa Claus, Evan babbled, oblivious to his mother's concerns. He was overcome with joy that Santa Claus would no longer be in his life. I'm not just worried about you, Evan. I'm also quite angry with you, Mum said, his eyebrows knitting into a scowl. Somehow you vandalized the fireplace. It looks like something out of a horror movie. Evan frowned. I never vandalized the fireplace. Mum sighed. Then how do you explain that, she said, pointing. Evan twisted his head around to face the fireplace. A solid crimson letter had been written on the brick wall behind the fireplace. The paint looked fresh, and Evan could see it still trickling down the wall. But not paint. Evan realized, but blood. Ho, ho, ho! I'm coming for you. That's actually a really crazy, sad story, and it, um, it kind of makes me think of, at least the part where his dad um, dies from falling down the chimney, is, is that scene in Gremlins where, I, I can't remember what the character's name is, the, the lady from the movie, her dad gets stuck in the chimney and dies. And uh, that's the kind of thing that popped in my head when I first heard that, but that's a pretty awful story. Not awfully written, but awful premise where he's, his dad dies and then he's, like, haunted by this Santa Claus character who just makes his life a living fucking hell. Yeah, overall, just a really, <laughs> a really sad story. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're having a, a nice holiday season like I am. I'm sitting right in front of my Christmas tree right now that me and my kids put up the other day. And, uh, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And, as always, remember to face your fears. Today is two days away from the anniversary of my niece's death. No one knows how she died, except her mother, who passed away recently. And me. I do not know who to tell, but I need to tell someone. No one would believe me anyway. They'd lock me up like they locked up my sister. I wouldn't blame them. I hardly believe what happened myself. Bethany was going to be 10 years old the day after Christmas. The year she died. She still believed in Santa. I thought she was too old for that shit, but her parents thought it was cute. 
They did everything they could to keep her from realizing it was just a lie. Bethany loved Christmas and Santa and elves and all that. She used to tell me about an elf that would hide in her house. I just thought her parents must be hiding a toy elf or something, but I asked them about it and they said they didn't have any elf dolls. I thought they were joking. Bethany's stories about the elf started getting stranger. She told me that one night she woke up to the elf sitting on the dollhouse next to her bed, watching her with its empty glass eyes. After that night, she said the elf turned bad. She said it would move around her room making strange noises at night. And she told me if she tried to get out of bed, the elf would just run towards her and bite and claw her feet and ankles. The elf, she said, had too many teeth which were long and thin, but not pointed. She said its nails were long and sharp like claws. Of course, I didn't believe her. But then she showed me the scars and new bite marks. The bites were normal human-sized, but very deep and definitely with more teeth marks. That's when I started to worry. I didn't believe in the elf at that point. I thought maybe she was doing it to herself, and I thought she might be seriously mentally ill. I wish I was right. I told my sister my concerns about her daughter. She was worried too. So she found a psychiatrist for her. I thought that would help Bethany. But as Christmas came nearer, she seemed to get worse. I was staying over at my sister's house for Christmas Eve, and Bethany asked me to sleep in the room with her to protect her from the elf. I said yes. I thought that was a good idea so I could figure out what was going on with her. Maybe she was biting her own ankles in her sleep. That night, Bethany woke me up and asked if I would get her some water. She didn't want to get up because she was afraid the elf would attack her. I didn't want to leave the poor girl in the room alone, so I told her she had to come with me. She didn't want to come, but I wouldn't let her stay. I should have listened. Oh, God. Maybe she would still be alive if I listened. It's my fault she's dead. When we got to the door, I saw it. The elf was tall with strange teeth and black white eyes. I thought I was imagining it, so I turned on the light. It didn't go away. I know I should have tried to leave, but instead, I tried to take a picture of it. As soon as I did, it started to run at me so fast I could barely see it. Everything happened so fast. Bethany, who had been standing so still, pushed me out of the room so hard that I fell to the floor. The door slammed shut. All I could hear was a voice screeching so loudly. I could hardly hear Bethany's screams. It sounded like the voice was saying Merry Christmas, but it wasn't pronounced right. It sounded like Merry Christmas. Anyway, I was trying to get back into the room, but the door was locked. I tried to kick it down, but I wasn't strong enough. I ran into the kitchen to find something to break the door as I called the police. They thought it was a joke. I don't understand how they didn't hear the screaming. How did her parents not wake up? I found a brick and decided that was good enough to make a hole in the door or something. Suddenly, I heard a ripping sound, and the screams and screeches stopped. I cautiously opened the door, which somehow unlocked, and the walls and bed and all her toys and furniture were bright red, soaked in Bethany's blood. On the floor, the elf was hovering over Bethany's corpse. It was split in half vertically and the elf was wearing her intestines around its neck and eating them. I screamed louder than I ever screamed before. Bethany's mother finally came out of her room and saw what had happened. She didn't even make a sound. She just stared at the horrifying scene. We closed the door and put things in front so it wouldn't open. We went into the living room to wait for the police. When the police finally arrived, they questioned us and her husband, who hadn't heard a thing. I couldn't say anything. It was like a dream. So unreal. I just sat there staring into space. The only one who told the police what happened was my sister. The police removed the barricade from the front of Bethany's room. But when they opened the door, nothing was there. The blood was gone. The elf. Bethany. Everything. The room looked completely normal. Besides snow blowing in from the window. Everything was gone. Like magic. The police started a search party. They thought she ran away. After everyone left, I stood in her room alone and cried. I heard the sound of bells, and then I heard the elf whispering, Merry Christmas. 
I ran out there. It's been a year now since Bethany's death. After Bethany died, my sister's mental health began to deteriorate. She boarded up the doors and windows of Bethany's old room. She never slept anymore. We found her trying to cut open her stomach several times, and we had to have her live in a mental hospital, where she ended up killing herself by making a noose out of her bedsheets. Now I'm the only one who knows what happened. Everyone else still thinks she's missing. I don't go near that house anymore, and I can't bring myself to talk to Bethany's father. But no matter what I do to forget what happened, I can't. Sometimes, I still hear the elf's voice at night, and I'm afraid it's going to kill me next. It's almost Christmas.